Okay, at the break, uh, a couple of people were just asking about uh, books. So the only book I'd, I'd recommend uh, that came out since the heart of the diaconate is a book called Remain in Me, Holy Orders, Prayer, and Ministry. Okay, Remain in Me, Holy Orders, Prayer, and Ministry. And that book is talking about the interior life of deacons, as it, as it also applies to all clerics, actually. But Remain in Me, Holy Orders, Prayer and Ministry, and it's, it's on Amazon. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we are grateful for the gift of the Eucharist. Help us to fall in love with it ever more deeply. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. So for a time there, I was director of uh, the diaconate for the Archdiocese of Omaha, and I would always tell the guys who were in formation that they should make a Eucharistic act each day. And that could be a visit to the Blessed Sacrament or a daily Mass. But I think it's essential for clerics to deepen that Eucharistic imagination, and that's certainly one of the ways to do it. Uh, if the schedule allows, or if we're not rationalizing our schedule, that is a very doable thing. Either daily Mass, or a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, or a holy hour, a, a half a holy hour, whatever you think you can do. But since we stand in the ambo, and since we proclaim the Word, the more the Eucharist is affecting us, and we are in love with it, the more we're going to, by grace, be able to lead our people more deeply into that same love. Well, we can't do that unless we love it ourselves, obviously. The scripture I just want to share with you today is Luke 14. Luke 14, 16 to 24. Luke 14, 16 to 24. I would say that this is the most important diaconal scripture in the New Testament. Prescinding from, of course, the foot washing scene in John's gospel. But this one totally encapsulates the diaconal identity and ministry. And the more you use this as Lexio Divina in your own private prayer with Scripture, I think the more your Eucharistic heart as a deacon is going to come to life. Now there are a lot of silly, silly ideas out there about the Eucharist, um, and usually it's along political lines, which is even more silly, because none of this stuff is going to last, politically I mean. So there are some people who would actually advise you, oh, don't do Eucharistic adoration. The poor need you. Go stay with the poor. And there, there'd be some people that would say that, well, when I'm, when I'm praying, I'm praying for the whole world, and therefore, you know, I don't have to do any kind of external ministry. So you take those two comedic extremes. And anything in the extreme in Catholicism you know is wrong. Because Catholicism is always a both-and religion. It is both Eucharistic adoration and service to those who are wounded and in need. And in fact, all of you in this room know that if you attempt to be with the poor without adoration, great difficulties arise. And one of the most frightening difficulties of all is that recentering of the ego back upon the ministry. In other words, this is my ministry. This is what I do. And it almost can become like I'm saving myself through these do-good acts. But if you immerse yourself in the daily mass or you immerse yourself in Eucharistic adoration, you know the mystery of Luke 14. And the mystery of Luke 14 is sent. You're sent. If someone stays really long and deep enough in Eucharistic adoration, at one point Jesus is going to say this to them, go, get out of here, go away. If they're really listening, adoration and contemplation always become ministry, always. If they're not listening, then it's some type of, you know, neurosis or some type of emotional problem. But if you're listening, there's an integration between the contemplation and the participation in the Eucharist and the capacity 
to actually minister in power. And once again, I just draw your attention to the saints. People always say, you know, you're busy, you're busy, you're busy, you're doing this, you're doing that. You don't have to be that busy. Just become a saint. Saints are not busy. You ever notice that? So I'll go back to my friend, Father Solanus. So he would sit by the friary door because he was a simplex priest. They thought he was a little stupid and he couldn't hear confessions and he couldn't uh, preach at mass because he didn't understand languages. And at that point, it was, it, this proves he was stupid. He was an Irish kid who joined a German province of friars. It's like, what's the matter? What's the matter? So he couldn't master the language. They didn't know if he was orthodox, doctrinally, whatever. So anyway, you can say mass as a simplex priest, but you can't preach or hear confessions. Okay. So he'd sit by the door and open the door to people's problems. He was the liminal presence. Mrs. Zeno you know, Shimawat comes in. Father Solanus, my husband, he's out of work. I don't know what to do. I got three kids. We're not. Father Solanus. We ask the Lord to bless this woman. Okay, go home. Trust Jesus. Here, make a little donation to the Capuchin Missions and go to Mass. Gone. You could be home for meatloaf with that kind of life. See that power? See how that's not about you? What's the time? No time. Go to Jesus. What are you doing hanging out here with me? When we gather people around ourselves, scary, dangerous. When we think we're that necessary, scary, dangerous. When our wives cry out, you're not home, you're always down at the church, scary, dangerous. Saints know that they are to send people to Jesus, not to themselves. And saints know that all the power is in that person's capacity to trust and be vulnerable and open to the living God. Notice also what Solanus did. He connected their wound, their need, their fear to the Mass. Do that. When someone comes to you for prayer, reconnect them with the Eucharist. Reconnect them with the Eucharist. Also, when someone comes to us for prayer, pray with them immediately. Pray with them immediately. I always carry a sacramental in my pocket, a little crucifix or a relic of a saint. And someone will come up to me and say, well, I have to go to the, the hospital tomorrow. I'm having this test. Would you pray for me? And I just get the relic. And I say, hold this relic and place it against your heart. And then I say a very quick prayer. And I send them off to Jesus. That's all. Done. Jesus will take care of that. So it's not, so look in your own life whether or not you're drawing too much regarding ministry to yourself. Remember, unless you're employed by the church, our salary is not that big. Our salary is not that big. And the other thing we always have to be careful of is we are not that needed. I remember there was a, um, a Broadway play critic in New York City. His name was something like a Jonathan von Hurstenberg or something like that. So he'd come out of his hotel where he lived. He, he lived in a hotel and the driver would be there to take him to his ne next play. And the driver would say, uh, Mr. von Hurstenberg, where do you need to go? And he would say, it matters not. I am needed everywhere. Say, that's not you. You are not needed everywhere. Pick one thing. And do it well. And remember we have wives and children and grandchildren. And that our sanctity is in the interpenetrating integrity of all of those vocations together. There is not one of us that needs to do a bunch of stuff. We need to do one thing deeply. Earnestly. And truly be present. And then God can unleash amazing powers in us. And he will. 
So here's our vocation. Here's Luke 14. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. At the time for the banquet, he sent his deacon to say to those who had been invited, Come, for all is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. I have bought a field and must see it. I bought some oxen and have to examine them. I've just gotten married and cannot come. So the deacon came and reported this to the master. Then the master, in anger, said to the deacon, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes in the city and bring in the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame. And the deacon said, Lord, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master sent the deacon, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be full. That's the deacon. That's your vocation. Notice, sent from the banquet. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Sent from the banquet. And we process right out into lay life. And we get lost in lay life. Because we are clerics living a lay lifestyle. Embedded deep in the neighborhood. Deep in our work. Plumber, truck driver, teacher. We are everywhere bringing the seeds of immortality, the Eucharist, into the nooks and crannies of lay life, which no priest could ever reach. Notice, you bring the Eucharist to the place no priest could ever reach. Your cubicle, your truck, your lawn service, no priest has ever entered that space in history. But you in holy orders, you live in that space. Doing what? Compelling people to come to the Eucharist. How do you compel them? Forcing them? No. By the beauty of your testimony and the fruit of your love of the Trinity seen publicly by your behavior. You compel them by your beauty. Who is that guy? The mystery. Where's he from? What's he doing? I'll tell you where he's from. He's from Luke 14. He's from the altar. And he bears the mystery that he receives and that he assists at and proclaims from the ambo. He bears that mystery in his body. He carries it. He is the sacrament. He doesn't bring the anointing of the sick. He is the sacrament. Just being in your presence, people could be healed. If you are drawing deep from the mystery we talked about, in the first hour. If you're not just an ethical do-gooder, but a supernatural man, you can heal. Never reduce or be embarrassed. Never reduce your ministry to ethics. And never be embarrassed of its supernatural source. If you are, you rendered yourself impotent. You're just another charitable fellow. If you cut yourself off from the supernatural, then we are unworthy of our being a sacrament ourselves. Notice what God the Father says. Now let's imagine this scripture as Jesus. It's God the Father sending Jesus 
into the world. It's the incarnation. The banquet is heaven. It's the eternity that the second person of the Blessed Trinity has always been abiding in with the Father. And then the Father says, go. And then Jesus, second person of the Blessed Trinity, takes on flesh and goes out into the highways and the hedgerows. You are that incarnation. The reason the church needed the diaconate is because the Holy Spirit knew that we needed the grace of holy orders more deeply embedded in Nazareth, in Bethlehem. And you bring that to the nooks and crannies of culture. This is your configuration to Christ. When we were ordained, we were configured to the servant mysteries of Christ. Whenever he saw someone in need, he went forward. He went out. He always went out of himself toward healing, reconciliation. He was always ordered toward the other. When he raised Lazarus or the little girl, or even when he called others to himself, he was going out of himself and serving the needs of humanity. Jesus embodied his diaconate in his invitation. What do you want me to do for you? That most powerful of diaconal questions in the mouth of the Lord Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? And then whatever the answer is, we pour the gospel into that wound. But to do so, we have to be in the Word. Fascinated with the Word. Lovers of the Word. Every Sunday we stand in the ambo and the people see you and they say, that man must know Scripture. Do you? Are you in the Word so deeply that you can pour it into the wounds of those you are sent to by the Father in the highways and the hedgerows? Most important, second most important thing, we attend to the altar. If you watch diaconal ministry on the altar, it is a ballet of circulation, circulating the gifts from the people, preparing them, giving them to the priest. The priest then offers them to the Father. The Father then offers himself through Jesus in the Spirit back to his church, which then we circulate through Holy Communion at the altar rail. It is pure circulation of love. We are a circuit. We help complete the circuit as deacons. When you receive the wine at the side of the altar and you pour in the wine and the water and you're mingling that mystery of the incarnation with divinity, And then you give that to the priest so he can raise it. And then the priest does something interesting at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. He gives the mystery back to you. You hold this chalice of salvation. And the deacon has always been entrusted with the blood of Christ. And in those parishes that are able to do it in a more correct manner, you would have perhaps two priests giving out Holy Communion, and the deacon would always be on the side with the chalice. That aspect of the mystery of Jesus which has been entrusted to our order, the blood and how appropriate is that? 
Deacon, go out quickly to the streets and the highways, to the hedgerows. Bury, bury deeply the blood of Christ in the culture. If you imagine a human body, the circulation of the blood keeps that body alive. And it goes into the deepest, darkest crevices of the body to do so. Blood reaches everywhere. That's you. You're not holding that chalice as if the priest would say, well, since you're here, you might as well do something. <laughs> you're holding that chalice because it is intrinsic to diaconal sending. Go. Like blood in the body, circulate salvation throughout culture to its deepest, darkest crevices where only you can go. That one day when you were in your work in your lawn service company and that one day when that guy stopped and talked to you and that one day when you gave testimony to him and that one day when you brought him back to mass by what you said, that blood reached the darkest, deepest crevice that no priest could ever reach. It was given to you. It's our honor to be that deep in culture, hidden, mostly hidden, like the blood beneath your skin. But without it, the body dies. Luke 14 is saying, go, bring the blood. What's the blood? The complete self-offering of Jesus. The mystery of Jesus' complete self-offering is the blood. What else? The blood is life. Bring life to the body of the church. Where you see the church becoming weak, sick, Bring the blood. Bring the divine life. Herald its coming by your presence, by your fidelity, by your creativity in ministry. But bring that blood so that people know where the source is. The altar. It's not here to entertain them. It's here to revive them because they have gone astray and have gotten lost in the hedgerows and they do not know their own dignity. And as deacons, because we consume the blood so deeply, consciously, willfully, vulnerably, we know what the blood can do. The blood is salvation. Bring it. Why? Because of what God the Father said in Luke 14. And here's the most hopeful verse of the scriptures, I would say. I want my house full. No limit. God wants everyone to participate in his eternal love. I want my house full. And that's why we go into the hidden deep places of culture to find those people who think that God doesn't want that and to reassure them that not only does he want it, but that's his intention toward us. What is God's intention toward me? Does he want to judge me and convict me and put me to hell? What's God's intention? I want you with me. I want you to live with me forever. And you do so 
by participating in the blood. In that little church on the corner, or a big church like this, on the highway, that place is the place where life is given. That ordinary place there. Surprise. It's where life is given. And one of the things we have to preach on more is how much Americans disdain ordinary life. And because they disdain ordinary life, they keep looking up to the clouds and looking beyond and dabbling in some fantasy world. And they miss the incarnation because they hate the ordinary. And because they hate the ordinary, they're going to miss the visitation of their salvation. Because the visitation of their salvation came as a baby. Not as a spaceship. Not as an explosion. Not as fireworks. Salvation came in the ordinary as a baby. One of the beautiful things, since we are embedded in lay life so deeply, to be heralds of the goodness of the ordinary. And notice how much God uses that. Bread, wine. Anything else? Could you jazz it up a bit? It's pretty ordinary. Bread, wine. No. Where? On the corner of Fifth and Locust. What? Salvation. You kidding? Bread, wine, Fifth and Locust? Yes. Go there and you will live. But you have to stop hating ordinary life. Because God has deigned that ordinary life, in other words, sacramental life, is the way of salvation. The deeper you go into the sacraments, the closer you're going to be to the one who says, I want my house full. As I said, for a while, I lived in Nebraska, and when Marianne and I moved to Nebraska, we moved to Omaha. And just like up in North Dakota, there's nothing in Nebraska. If there are any Nebraskans in here, I apologize. But we went to Omaha, and every so often we'd say, well, Omaha's a nice city, it's, it's big, it's nice, but I wonder what's outside Omaha? Nothing. And we were from, originally from New York, and we would drive out of Omaha, and we'd start seeing these big buildings, and they were grain elevators. So we thought, oh, here comes a town. No, those aren't towns. Those are grain elevators. First of all, we had to figure out what the hell that is. We didn't even know. And always in Nebraska, beneath a grain elevator, is a gas station called Casey's. And all they do is sell pizza. Pizza, gas, and for some reason, they hover around grain elevators. And when I had to go and direct the deacon program, the Archbishop said, you can't have the program in Omaha because our archdiocese goes way out to the middle of nowhere. You've got to find a spot in the middle of nowhere and have your program out there. So I had to drive out there once a month. And I would go through this town called Rogers, or I always forget the name of it, Rogers or something like that. And the sign said, as I passed by, population 33. And I was always like, thank God for those three. Right? They didn't knock those three off. They didn't round it up or round it down. It was 33 people in Rogers, Nebraska. And basically, Rogers, Nebraska was a grain elevator, a Casey's, a Catholic church, and some other little enterprises. And I met a woman who had lived there her whole life. She was 80-something years old. Now, I, I passed over that very quickly. I met a woman who lived there her whole life. You can't see in my demeanor right now how frightening that was to hear. You were born here? Yes, I was born here. In this place? No, I didn't say it like this. In this place? And you never left? No. And she fell in love with some kid who lived there and worked in the grain elevator. They got married. They had two girls, baptized. Girls, you know, got married at the church. Then they left, of course. They don't live there anymore. Husband died. He was buried from that church. She still lives there. Goes to daily mass if she can. Now, as an arrogant New Yorker, like, 
what the hell? How do you live in a place like this? Right? So she didn't say it this way, but this is how she described it in my interpretation. She said, oh, excuse me, Mr. Superficial. I live here because I live in the depths. I don't live in Rogers, Nebraska. I live the sacraments. I live in the sacraments. I'm a Catholic. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I live there. Where do you live? Catholicism is mostly about depth. Deep. That's why Father Solanus could say when he goes to Huntington, Indiana, will God be there? Doesn't matter. Depth is everywhere. For the superficial, they are always agitated, always restless, always lonely, always looking for the new, the novel, the next. They're always trying to escape. That's why fantasy is so big in the U.S. today. We need to escape what? Reality. What's the Eucharist? The most real of reality. You can't get any more real than the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, offered to you as your salvation in your broken humanity. You cannot get any more real. And yet people are moving away from it in droves, choosing fantasy instead, choosing escapist behavior instead. Talking to this guy the other day, living, living to go on an Alaskan cruise. An Alaskan cruise. And this is the most quintessential American thing. If anyone's been on an Alaskan cruise, I apologize to you. But what I'm going to say is I mean to undermine it. Think of looking forward to that. All you do is you put America on a boat and ship it up to Alaska and look over the rail and see a whale and go, there it is the whale and then you go back to your casino your shopping mall your hotel room your restaurants in other words you go back into america but you're just on a ship you were so afraid of reality you brought the entire culture with you to alaska so you could take an instagram picture of a whale and say to people, there's my whale. Ha ha. I did something new and novel and next. And you're stuck in Rogers. Well, I'm up here in Alaska with all the rest of America. That is the saddest thing I've ever heard. The happiest thing I've ever heard is that lady in Rogers. That it's absolutely possible to be happy deep in the ordinary. Because everything is being given in the Mass. We'll go back to the beginning, what I said. God. <laughs> Thanks, God. Thanks for giving yourself to me. It, it, can I go on an Alaskan cruise, too? Because you're just, you're just kind of not fulfilling. But thanks for giving yourself to me. Hey, honey, thanks for marrying me, but could I have a couple girls on the side? You, you're really not that fulfilling to me. After a while, it just kind of gets ordinary, you know? Living with the same person, and I want to jazz it up a bit. What's that called? Idolatry. It's all idolatry. That we really do not think God can satisfy us. And so we keep looking for the new God, the new escape.
the new trend. Now we all have to get on a new damn Twitter. What the hell's the name of it? I forgot it. Threads. You got to get on threads. Because the next 20 year old who walks in is going to say, I got on threads. Oh, that, that's right. That's my son. No, I got on threads. You got to communicate. What the hell? I don't have to communicate with you at all. <laughs> if you keep changing reality every five seconds. No. How about we just talk when I see you? Nah, forget it. Jazz it up. We need more than God. You've got to be kidding. You can't just live for the Eucharist, baptism, marriage. You can't. It's got to be more. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Rogers, Nebraska? Ordinary. Could deacons be the herald of the ordinary as filled with salvation? Could we bring that blood from the altar into the nooks and crannies of culture and revivify people's grasp on reality? This day, you will die. Reality. What are you living for? And getting into that habit of just enjoying the ordinary. What's the Catholic Church call it? The simple life. What is the simple life? Putting relationships first. You want to be a billionaire? I guess it's possible. If you're putting relationships first. That's simplicity. And only the simple ones will get into heaven because that's all heaven is. If you don't like relationships, how are you going to like eternity? That's all that's there. Our people. <laughs> the Alaskan cruises are over. It's just people. That's what the Sabbath used to be, right? The Sabbath used to be a day of rest so we could all get together and be with people. Even the people we didn't like. It was sort of like forced fun. But you were still choosing the right choice. What was the right choice? It's Sunday. I don't work. I socialize. I'm with people. When I was a little kid, my father would ask the same question every Sunday. Lucille, what are we doing? You know what we're doing. We're going to the 1030. All right, good. What are we doing after that? You know what we're doing. We're going to Rose's. That was her sister. What are we going to do at Rose's? You know what we're doing. We're going to eat ham. And that's what the hell we did. <laughs> Every Sunday, that's what we did. We went to the 1030. We went to Rose's. We ate ham. And the uncles and the cousins and the nieces and everyone sat around, ate ham, drank beer, avoided the people you didn't like, ate the ham, and then did it all again next Sunday. What's that called? This is going to be very frightening. Heaven. <laughs> yeah, I know there. No ham, it's kosher. <laughs> but heaven, that's heaven. Minus the sin, minus the sin, but it's heaven. So minus the sin means, you know, Uncle Festus won't be there. <laughs> but minus the sin. All that circulation of love, all that love is going to be, that's eternity. And St. Catherine of Siena and Catherine of Genoa said, if you are not in heaven before you die, you ain't going. Because heaven is all the way to heaven. You're not going to be surprised. You're not going to die and say, how the hell did I get here? Because you're going to be in heaven before you die. There's continuity between this earth and eternal life. There's not discontinuity. You are either becoming that man dead to all things and alive to Christ, or you're not. Heaven is all the way to heaven. So we have to learn the ways of living in reality, living in the ordinary, and seeing it as ennobling and sufficient for my human nature. We have to learn those ways. This is what my wife tried to teach me, and she was very successful at it, actually. 
When we first got married, I was finishing my doctorate and I was very busy. And I would go teach, I was teaching and then I was going to school at night. Teaching, going to school at night, very busy. So my wife said, hey, you know, I don't see you anymore. Um, I want to see you, so how about this? How about every day you come home for a happy hour at 5 p.m.? I said, I cannot come home for a happy hour at 5 p.m. That's the time I'm done teaching and I go to the library and I start studying. I gotta get this doctorate done. You know, I'm doing it for you. Pause. <laughs> and she just looked at me. And there's a look, right? And every man in this room knows that look. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a look that makes a husband, let's just say, and this is polite company, so I'll say it politely. But when the wife, and it's magical almost, but when she gives that look, like the husband is frightened unto defecation. <laughs> it's just, I, I must obey. I don't know what the next thing is. And she didn't even say anything. But that look... So I just turned around and walked away. And as I'm walking away, she said, five o'clock. So I went to work next day, 4.30, closing my books, getting ready to go to the library. Damn, I gotta go home to the one I love. <laughs> Damn, what a pain in the ass. I know I chose her and all that stuff, but doggone it. I just want to study the Bible. <laughs> so I went home. And I walk in the house, and I don't see her there. And she's out in the back. We had a little patio in the back. She's sitting there. Table, two chairs. She's got a little bowl of pretzels. She's got Chardonnay for herself. She has a little Jameson and ginger ale for me. So I'm a masculine, mature man. So as I see that, I say, you know what? I'm not going to say a damn thing to her. I'm just going to sit there. If she wants me home, I'll teach her to love me. Right? I'll teach her to love me. The pathology is just self-evident. So I sit there. I come out. And she starts talking. Blah, 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 blah. You know, she was an elementary school teacher. And she just talked about these little second graders. Bobby did this, Miss Ma, the copy machine broke, blah, 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 blah. She's drinking her Chardonnay, blah, 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 drinking, grabbing her pretzel, Chardonnay, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting. Huh? Huh? How's this, huh? I'm sitting. She downs the Chardonnay. She's done talking. She gets up. It's only about 15, 20 minutes. She looks at me and she says, thanks for coming. I'll see you here tomorrow. <laughs> and she left. And I am sitting at the table about to explode. What the hell is going on? But of course I was afraid of her. <laughs> which is always a good foundation for marriage in the beginning. So then I showed up the next day and I did the same thing. And I showed up the next day and I did the same thing. About the fifth day, I took a sip. And then I had a pretzel. And then, you know, 37 years later, we've been drinking every day and eating pretzels. 37 years, right? The happy hour saved our marriage because it humanized me. What did? Being in the presence. What dehumanizes us? Choosing isolation, emotional, spiritual. That's hell all the way to hell. The opposite. But she reached the darkness.
and called me into his own marvelous light. And God used pretzels and Jameson and a pretty blonde. Can you get any more ordinary than that? That's the sacramental life. Deep, deep in the ordinary, God waits. The deacon, Luke 14, sent into the depths and folds of the ordinary. Go find those who are lost in the, in the dark and bring them the blood of Christ. Bring them life. Bring them life and life to the full. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we thank you for everything you are giving. Teach us how to receive. So that we might give in return. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, are there any, uh, we got a little bit of time, any comments, confusions, graces, meditations you want to make for the next five minutes or so? Any comments, questions, graces, confusions? What would you, what are you going to say out in the hallway that you should say here so we can clarify things? That's fear. <laughs> Any comments, questions, confusions? All right, we'll just sit with Jesus for a minute, just in 30 seconds of silence. We'll see if the Holy Spirit wants to raise anything. Okay, anything there? Yep. Yeah, I know, that's a tough one. All, all, you know, just use me as a scapegoat. Go home and act fat, dumb, and happy. And just say, hey, I was at this workshop. And this deacon had this idea. And just start the conversation like that. And see if there's any opening or if he's totally closed. If there's a slight opening... Just kind of say that, oh, I, I would, you know, I'll help in any way. I'll write up the catechesis for the bulletin, whatever it takes, so that we can extend the silence a little bit. So that would be a good ignition. Just say, hey, I was here, and, and this weird guy said that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's the biggest yeah, that's the biggest discernment. How do you just do the one thing? There's the first thing that has to be evaporated in our mind is that doing more will speed my salvation. That that is hidden in the depths. Like cuz we're we're all still wanting to give our resume to Jesus. And and that's that's hard to get out of us. And there's nothing in Scripture that I've ever read that said the multiplication of many different things is salvific. Not at all. You don't think that a guy who just dedicated himself to going around the corner to the nursing home that was in his parish confines and did that for 30 years, you don't think that's worthy of being a saint? The one thing? Of course it is. So we have to purify ourselves of thinking that the resume is impressive to Jesus. I remember once I got hired at a job and they didn't look at my resume. 
I was so pissed. I said, come on, look at all this cool stuff I did. How can you hire me without looking at it? My identity was in that cool stuff. And that's purgatory. That's what purgatory is going to be. Jesus is going to open the door to a deacon and say, hey, welcome. Why'd you do all that stuff I didn't ask you to? Welcome to purgatory. Because that ego of yours has got to be pruned. <laughs> right? You left your wife to go and do all these multiple things. And then the other thing is, excuse the expression, but you got to man up a bit against priests. And here's, here's what, this is very interesting. Priests would always call when I was director and say, hey, we need more deacons. Give me more deacons. Oh, really? What do you want the deacon to do? Well, yeah, I want to take communion to the hospital and visit nursing homes and homebound and all that stuff. I said, you know who can do that? A lay person can do that. I'll give you the number to the lay uh, formation office. When you're ready to have a brother cleric imagine with you the new spiritual life of your parish, then call me, I'll give you a deacon. Because priests do not know that you are brother clerics. They just see you as free labor. And every time they see you as free labor, you must turn them toward lay ministry. Sorry, you don't need to be ordained to do that, Father. Sorry, you don't need to be ordained to do that, Father. What you need to be ordained to do is for me to dream and pray and lead this parish with you. That has to be the new model for the diaconate, or it's not going to last. So you've got to kind of man up. And believe me, as a seminary professor, they don't give the permanent diaconate one iota in formation. They don't even know who the hell you guys are. They are only formed in priestly things. So when they come to the parish and they meet you, the only thing they're going to extend is whatever their experience is of the diaconate. They were not theologically formed in it at all. It's an incredible lacuna. And maybe you guys just read, you know, uh, Greg's, Deacon Greg's uh, column that not one deacon has been invited to the synod. Not one deacon, nuns, lay people, priests, cardinals, bishops, archbishops, monks, hermits, not one deacon. We've got a big problem with ecclesial imagination around the sent servant. We don't, we don't inhere in that imagination. Now, to one extent, we could say, well, that's pretty good. We're hidden. We're left alone. We can do what God wants. On one level, that's good. On another level, people shouldn't be ignorant about what a deacon is, especially a priest. So man up and say no to him and get lay people to do it if he needs help. And the, yeah, and the, the other thing was that to say no is very important for your other commitments, especially your wife. So you're always, remember your first spiritual director is always your wife. So take the barometer from home. I remember a couple times at, at home the phone would ring, and it, those were in the days when you had phones, and it had like a user ID, and it came up, St. Margaret Mary Parish. And I'd look, and I'd let it ring. And Marianne from the kitchen would say, pick it up. That's it. She's my spiritual director. <laughs> so sometimes you have to realize that you're living with your spiritual director and, and give her credence because God is definitely using her to direct you. And that direction might be the opposite of that experience I had. The direction could be, let that phone ring. I got one button undone, buddy. See, that'd be a, that would be a good night. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Okay. That, that's fine. Thank you very much, as long as they're from somewhere. <laughs> Anything else before we go? All right. God bless you. Enjoy lunch and fellowship. Thank you. Thank you.